this video is going to explain how monetary policy works in an economy. It's going to use three separate diagrams, which we'll look at separately, and then we'll combine them all. There's another video that explains the effect of monetary policy, but this is the actual workings of the policy. The first diagram we're going to look at is the supply and demand of money in an economy. The price and the quantity is shown on the supply and demand diagram, just like any other, but the price of money is the interest rate. So the price of, uh, of you getting money today is the interest rate that you'll have to pay on that money. The demand for money is a downward sloping demand curve. And this is because at lower rates of interest, people will demand higher amounts of money. The supply of money in an economy at any one time is fixed by the government or by a central bank. And so we have a perfectly inelastic money supply, which is a vertical line like this. The interaction of supply and demand for money will leave us with an equilibrium level of interest. And uh, the interest rate, the symbol for an interest rate, is just the lowercase r. So this will be the level of interest in the economy. The second diagram we're going to look at is the demand for investment. The demand for investment is a downward sloping curve because as the interest rate falls, people will demand more money. In this case, it's usually we're looking at businesses borrowing more money, so they're demanding money in the form of taking out loans, and they'll, they'll borrow more because the interest rate is lower. So very quickly, if the interest rate is R1, then the level of investment will be I1. If the level of interest was to fall from R1 to R2, then we'll have an increase in investment from I1 to I2. And this is why the demand for investment is a downward sloping demand curve. The third diagram we need to look at is an aggregate demand and aggregate supply curve. And this, shows the, this will show the effect of changes in investment on aggregate demand and national income. There is a video about expansionary and contractionary monetary policy in this aggregate demand and aggregate supply model, uh, and it's called expansionary and contractionary policy, monetary policy in an aggregate supply, supply aggregate demand model, and you could watch that to understand this video more. We're now going to place these three models together. Initially, this is what the level of interest is in the economy, with the supply of money, the demand for money, leading to an interest rate of R1. The government decides they're going to enact an expansionary monetary policy. An expansionary monetary policy, the end result will, is that we'll want to have an increased level of national income. In order to get increased national income, we need higher levels of investment. To get higher levels of investment, we need a lower interest rate. And we know that in this diagram, the government or the central bank has control over the supply of money. And we can see that if they were to increase this supply of money to the right, then this will lead to a new level of interest, which is lower than the original level of interest. The increase in the supply of money will lead to a decrease in the interest rate from R1 down to R2. The way that the government influences the supply of money in the economy is by buying and selling government bonds. In this case, it wants to increase the amount of money in the economy. That means it needs to hand money over to people in the economy. And in doing this, they will be buying back government bonds. So the central bank or the government will be buying back government bonds that will put more money into the economy, increase the supply of money from SM to SM2, and that will decrease the interest rate from R1 to R2.
By decreasing the level of in interest from R1 to R2, there will be an increase in investment, and we'll see this here as an increase from I1 to I2. And so the decrease in interest leads to an increase in investment on the second diagram. This will translate into the third diagram. We have an equilibrium level of national income at NY1, and this comes from the aggregate demand one, aggregate demand level one, which is equal to C plus I1 plus G plus X minus M. And we know from the previous diagram, this diagram here, that I1 has increased from I1 to I2 as a result of the decreased interest rate. And so we're going to get a new level of aggregate demand that is greater than the old level of aggregate demand. So now we'll get uh, this line moving to AD2, which is going to be equal to C plus I2 plus G plus X minus M. The increase in investment from I1 to I2 is this distance over here. And the end result of this increase in aggregate demand, which came from the increase in investment, is that it will move from NY1 to NY2. So a decrease in interest rate led to an increase in investment, led to an increase in aggregate demand, and an increase in national income from NY1 to NY2. We'll quickly run through the reverse situation where the government decides to decrease the supply of money in the economy. To decrease the supply of money, they need to take money away from people. The way that they would do this would be to issue government bonds. By issuing those government bonds, people will purchase those bonds, give money to the economy, and this will decrease the supply of money in that economy. We'll also know that in order to attract this, that these bonds will have a, a high interest rate so that people will want to buy them. And the effect of both of these things will be that the supply of money will fall from SM to SM2, supply of money, and this will lead to, so SM to SM2, and this will lead to a new equilibrium level of interest rate, and so now that interest rate has risen from R1 to R2. The increase in interest rate from R1 to R2 can be seen in the next diagram. So the interest rate increases from R1 to R2, and as you would expect, higher interest means that businesses are less likely to borrow money for investment. They'll decrease their investment plans, and that will lead to a decrease in investment from I1 to I2. And now this time, the decrease of investment from I1 to I2 will lead to a decrease in aggregate demand from AD1 to AD2. This decrease in investment from AD1 to AD2 leads to new level of aggregate demand uh, and this leads to a decrease in national income from NY1 to NY2. So this has been a contractionary monetary policy. The government has increased the level of interest rates to decrease investment, decrease aggregate demand and decrease national income. These three diagrams can actually be re uh, represented as, as one big diagram with three separate parts. We'll look at the case of an expansionary policy. So we know that with an expansionary policy, what we are hoping for is for the interest rate to fall, and by the interest rate falling, investment will increase and aggregate demand will also increase. So we're going to begin with uh, the interest rate being at R1 with the supply of money at SM1. The central bank or the government is going to increase the supply of money in this economy. So we're going to move the supply of money from SM1 to SM2. As a result of the increase from SM1 to SM2, the interest rate will fall from R1 to R2. Now, because on the second diagram, we also have the interest rate measured on that vertical axis, we're actually able to take this blue line across 
and start with our initial level of interest at R1 and we know that this will lead to an, a level of investment uh, the equilibrium level of investment at that interest rate will be I1 and the decrease in the interest rate from R1 to R2 can also be carried across so now in this expansionary monetary policy the supply of, of money has increased from SM1 to SM2 leading to a decrease in interest rate from R1 to R2 and the decrease in the interest rate from R1 down to R2 has led to an increase in investment from I1 to I2. The third panel shows the aggregate demand and aggregate supply model for the economy and at the original position where the interest rate was R1, the level of investment equaled I1 and that led to a level of aggregate demand of AD1 and a national, uh, national income level of NY1. As a result of the increase of in investment, aggregate demand is going to increase from AD1 to AD2. And so AD1 would be equal to C plus I1 plus G plus X minus M and AD2 would be C plus I2 plus G plus X minus M and as a result we'll have a new level of equilibrium national income uh, from the result of this expansionary monetary policy and will increase from NY1 to NY2. When drawing this diagram we should try to show that this level of investment that goes from I1 to I2 I will just get the right line there this increase of investment from I1 to I2 to so this distance here it should be about the same distance, well, it should be exactly the same distance as this distance here so I'll just um, do this with a couple of lines here So we're trying to show that these diagrams are all linked together. So the decrease in interest rate from R1 to R2 as a result of the increase in money supply from SM1 to SM2 leads to a decrease in interest rate. The decrease in interest rate increases investment. That level of investment is translated into an increase in aggregate demand and it moves up like that. Individually, it's a very simple diagram, but when you look at this completed diagram, it's, it's very impressive. And if you can produce this as a, in an essay on monetary policy, uh, it's showing the marker that you really understand how the process works. I have seen the diagram also represented in this way. Uh, and it's exactly the same, except that aggregate demand, aggregate supply curve, we've actually turned it onto its side. It does a couple of things. First of all, uh, it makes it fit onto your page better instead of going all the way across your page. But that increase in investment that we drew across can actually translate into the diagram. So just going through the same process, I've uh, got the central bank or the, or the government increasing the supply of money in the economy. They would do this by buying bonds and handing money over to, to the citizens. That will lead to a decrease in the interest rate from R1 to R2. Decrease interest rate means higher levels of investment from I1 to I2 and that will lead to an increase in aggregate demand. So original aggregate demand would be AD1 and that would be equal to C plus I1 plus G plus X minus M and the new level of aggregate demand is AD2 which is C plus I2 plus G plus X minus M. So this diagram and this diagram is showing exactly the same thing. Uh, what we've been able to do is this, uh, this uh, large level of, of blue lines in between the second and third panel, we're able to just translate them straight down into the diagram. I don't think I have a preference for, for either one, but if you can understand how both of them work, then you might have a preference for the one that you would draw. I'm just going to quickly run through the diagram for a contractionary monetary policy. So I want the economy to get smaller. That means I want investment to fall and investment will fall when interest rates rise. I can see on that first panel to get interest rates to rise, 
I need to decrease the supply of money in the economy. So I take money away from the people of the economy and in exchange I give them government bonds and that increases the interest rate. That increased interest rate from R1 to R2 is translated over into the second panel and it leads to a decrease in investment. So this is our original level of investment and investment decreases in this direction. So as a result of the decrease in the supply of money, interest rates have gone up and interest rates increasing from R1 to R2 leads to a decrease in investment from I1 to I2. And that's going to be translated over here where we're going to have our uh, original aggregate demand line, which will be, we'll call it AD1, and AD1 will be C plus I1 plus G plus X minus M, and will give us a national income equilibrium of NY1. The increase in a decrease in investment from I1 to I2 means that aggregate demand will fall. And it will fall from AD1 down to AD2. The decrease in aggregate demand will lead to a decrease in national income from NY1 to NY2. And that is the contractionary monetary policy. We could draw it on that other diagram as well. And again, you can see this diagram uh, looks very impressive when you can put all three of them together like that. It comes from the simple process of understanding this panel, this panel, and this panel, and then uh, looking at them individually and then putting them all together into a diagram like this or to a diagram like this.